Okay, so welcome everybody to another Insight APSAB webinar. My name is Jim Hunt. I'm one of the nurse educators here at Insight, and it gives me great pleasure to present these webinars for you for you guys. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming back and joining us this week. This is our first week back after a couple of week break for the school holidays. And hopefully we've got an exciting end to the seminar with some of our speakers coming up so that you'll stay with us till the end of the year. Before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're presenting today. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to also extend that welcome and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us in webinar land. So welcome and thank you. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce somebody that I've worked with a little, a little bit and I've asked to do several presentations for me at different venues and she's always been more than willing to accommodate. So this is Dr. Sarah Riley and she's going to be talking to us today about the complexities of codeine dependence um, and she's going to tell you a little bit about um, her work in that and some studies that they're doing uh, in that area. So without much further ado I'll hang, hand over to Dr. Sarah Riley who's going to talk about codeine dependence. So over to you Sarah. Thank you, Jim. Hello. It's um, a bit odd giving a talk and not knowing who I'm talking to. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess this is the new COVID times, isn't it? So um, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jim. Um, I will be talking today about codeine dependence, which is something I've um, fallen into as an area of interest, I suppose, over the last few years. Um, and I would like to, at that point, acknowledge um, Mark Daglish and Jeremy Haler, who are the directors of Malaluka and Biella, our Metro North Alcohol and Drug Services, who've um, really been instrumental in um, both introducing me to any research and, and looking into codeine. And so they're my supervisors and have been guiding me along each of these steps um, and are heavily involved in, in both of these projects. So thank you to them as well. Um, so today I'll be talking primarily about one of the first codeine studies that um, Jeremy, Mark and I have completed, but also talking to you a little bit about a second one, which is currently in the recruitment stages, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end of the talk. Um, just briefly, because I was made aware there was a few people from non-public services involved, um, a few definitions. When I say ADS, I'm just referring to alcohol and drug services, and I'm primarily referring to public services there. Um, you'll hear me talk quite a bit today about CACCs, um, which is combination analgesics containing codeine. And you can see in the background of that slide there, there's a few familiar brands. And certainly prior to the 2018 rescheduling, I've been told that there was over 60 different types of codeine products. And what was perhaps a little bit confusing was that the amount of codeine per tablet varied significantly from down at five milligrams per tablet all the way up to 30, of course, if you had a script for Panadine Fort. And they had varying um, uh, combinations of medications with them, whether that was ibuprofen, paracetamol, or doxalamine, the sedative antihistamine. Um, so CACC refers to when it's got that combination. OTP, opioid treatment programs, if I'm referring to METOD, then it's, it's really just medication assisted treatment of opioid dependence, which is how Queensland tends to um, refer to our opioid treatment programs, which is the holistic approach incorporating psychological therapy. So to get us started as to what sort of, um, I think, kicked off the concern about pharmaceutical opioid dependence, it probably began um, initially within the US. And this is just a quote highlighting that last year there was more than 70,000 overdose deaths in America and it was something like 80% were attributed to opioids um, and we know that with OxyContin um, that was a huge um, issue uh, within the US and whilst we haven't had the same degree of problems uh, with pharmaceutical opioid dependence we certainly have the potential that things could escalate like it has overseas. Um, and I think that this change in dynamics of um, substance use reflects a number of different things. One, that we have an aging population, that we have increasing um, 
frequency of chronic pain and, and perhaps that we have a society that's perhaps a little bit conditioned to expect that there might be a pill which will solve their problems and, and leave them pain free and there's that real expectation uh, which has been certainly a part of the escalating use of pharmaceutical opioid dependence. So this is just a table that shows how things have shifted within Queensland OTP. And so over on the left, you've got 2000, and then you've got 2013 on the right. Um, and you can see that um, codeine is the uh, orange bar, which is just increasing um, with every year and continued from 2013 on. And the turquoise is oxycodone, which um, you can also see has had a really big jump um, in those recent years. Whereas heroin, which is the dark blue bar, um, you know, back in 2000, it was accounting for 75% of um, the, the patients presenting to be initiated on OTP, whereas over at 2013, it's down below 50%. So there's been a real significant change um, in the type of client that we're treating here at Alcohol and Drug Services. And that's one of the things that I'll talk about as, I'm, as I move through this study is really how... How do we need to think about the new demographics of people who will be accessing our services and, and are our services still um, appropriate in their current format? And that was one of the things that prompted, I think, Mark and Jeremy to think about how we could initiate um, these studies and, and, and learn and reflect on this area. Um, so, just a little bit of background then on codeine dependence. So historically, codeine was considered a safe, socially acceptable, and often considered a weak opioid. Um, and that was perpetuated by the fact that it was readily available over the counter, both here in Australia, but also in the UK, Canada, France, New Zealand, um, all of those countries had over the counter CACCs up until very recently. And this was despite the fact that there was really rel relatively limited evidence um, showing us that codeine was a superior medication for acute pain. And there are some nice studies um, looking at ac acute pain showing that ibuprofen and paracetamol uh, appear to be equally effective for chronic, uh, sorry, for acute pain when compared to codeine products. Um, and this is particularly the case for those that were over the counter, which were only 15 milligrams of codeine. And yet, despite this lack of evidence, um, the, ready the readily accessible nature of the medication meant that they were often used for very prolonged periods without um, medical supervision. And that was for chronic non-cancer pain. And in 2013, they, um, we know that we sold about two, uh, sorry, we sold 42 million packs of opioid analgesics um, and that codeine accounted for two thirds of the sales and that 15.4 million of those were over the counter CACCs. So it, it, and Mark was saying to me recently that it, codeine remains the most prescribed opioid. Um, and so that just gives you an idea of the size of the problem. In 2016, the National Drug Household Survey of Australia found that 3.6% of Australians had recently, mis had recently used pharmaceutical analgesics for non-medical purposes. And about 75% of that group reported that they had um, used CACCs. And that was an increase from 33% of that group in 2013. So 33 up to 75% just in three years. Um, so codeine was certainly becoming um, an increasing problem. And when you put that into real numbers, it's probably around 500 thousand Australians who had used codeine in a way that it was not medically intended. And I think most of you would be aware of the fact that there are a number of risks associated with particularly the, um, the combination products. So there is a risk of renal tubular acidosis, hypokalemia, gastrointestinal bleeding, which is the most common one with anemia and perforation. Um, but also there's the risk of hepatotoxicity. One of the other things that I think sometimes slips under the radar a little bit is the fact that codeine itself has a number of risks. And um, Roxburg did a nice study in 2015 looking at over a thousand codeine related deaths and found that accidental overdose accounted for a really significant number of those deaths. 
Um, and for every two S8 opioid deaths, so the prescribed opioids, OxyContin, et cetera, there was one codeine related death. So it's not just the combination products. The codeine itself can be quite a risk in terms of um, respiratory depression and accidental overdose. And that's where I think um, we became quite interested in, you know, what's going on with this unpredictable drug. It's meant to be a weak opioid. How are people having un, um, unexpected overdoses? And I think that that comes back to its um, pharmacokinetic profile. And I know that Jim and I were talking about this and, and we were speaking about the fact that we know that um, most of us will know someone for whom codeine has uh, either been absolutely wonderful, you know, perfect pain relief, made them so calm, or we might know someone who said it did absolutely nothing, or like my mum, it makes them really, really sick. Um, and this variation in effect is due to its pharmacokinetics, as I said. So codeine is a prodrug. Um, in order to exert any kind of analgesic effect, it needs to be converted and metabolized um, through the cytochrome P450 system um, through to morphine. And it relies almost on entirely on this step um, in order to have uh, efficacy as a painkiller. And we know that there's a very wide spectrum of CYP2D6 um, enzyme activity in the population. And that's determined by the number of genes that people have that encode for the enzyme structure and the number of copies of genes that they have. And variability in the number of genes uh, that people have can really lead to um, variation in metabolism of a variety of different medications. So of course, codeine, that's what we're focusing on, but also oxycodone, tramadol, and many of the SSRIs as well. We know that about 10% of the population don't express CYP2D6 at all, and they are considered poor metabolizers and will receive almost no analgesia from codeine. Then we know that we have a proportion who have two or three copies of CYP2D6, and they're considered ultra rapid metabolizers who will receive um, much higher amounts of morphine. So typically in a, in a kind of perfect world, we're told that for every seven milligrams of codeine that's ingested, you'll produce about one milligram of morphine. However, in ultra rapid metabolizers, you're going to have a significantly larger amount. And, and that can be hard to quantify because you could have two copies or three copies. And so it's quite an unpredictable um, opioid in that regard. There's a number of um, quite tragic case studies that highlight the challenges that come with having a medication where you're unable to predict how people will respond. And so there's been some sad cases of children post-surgery um, who would have clearly, their parents wouldn't have been aware that they were ultra rapid metabolizers and there was respiratory depression and death that followed um, you know, normal doses of pain stock, which contains codeine. There's also some stories of, uh, or case reports of infants of breastfeeding mothers who were given um, very appropriate normal doses of codeine post-birth um, and that led to respiratory depression in the breastfed infant. Um, and finally, there's always the risk in people who are particularly poly drug users. Um, and this may be people that are following all of the instructions not taking more than they're meant to, but who are on a combination of medications. And we've all seen this kind of patient where they're on antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, gabapentinoids, um, and then you throw in what might seem like a relatively harmless amount of panadine fort for some kind of acute pain. Um, and, and that can lead to a surprising amount of morphine if they happen to be an ultra rapid metabolizer. And so this is an area of concern. And I will be coming back to this topic um, when I discuss my second, um, our second study, which is actually looking at um, whether or not we, patients who have come to us requiring OTP for codeine dependence, whether they're actually more likely to be ultra rapid metabolizers um, and whether that explains kind of how they may have become dependent on codeine or an element of it. So I'll return to this um, slide later. So 
Back when I started this study uh, with Mark and Jeremy, I have to say this was about two years ago. Um, it took us a little while. I've just finished it and, and was able to get that um, ticked off as one of my scholarly projects for my fellowship recently, which was excellent. Um, but I began this a little while ago and the real trigger for that, of course, was that in February 2018, they were bringing in the scheduling change. Um, and most of you will remember that there was a lot of debate, particularly with the Pharmaceutical um, Guild of Australia pushing back about the fact that we'd be overloaded um, with the GPs would be overloaded, the addiction services would be overloaded if we took um, codeine off the market. And there was a lot of debate but in the end the TGA decided that the risks uh, outweighed the benefits um, and I think that as we prepared for this there was a lot of concern that we would be really inundated um, with numbers of patients that had been dependent um, on codeine uh, and who were now unable to access uh, their medication and it's not surprising that we were a little bit concerned um, when you think about how that it had you know, the number of people misusing codeine had doubled in three years. Certainly we have seen between 2007 and 2016 that um, the number of treatment episodes at local ADSs for um, codeine dependence had gone from about six to 14%. And this was before the TGA, TGA change. Um, in 2016, we had about 17% of our clients um, uh, sorry, of Australian clients on OTP listing codeine as a primary drug of concern. Um, so it was certainly reasonable that we would be a little bit concerned about how we were going to cope. And so that led into then um, planning the first study, which um, really made us think about a few different stages of what we needed to do. So first of all, we wanted to sort of chart, well, how did our presentations to Biella and Malaluca change? Did we get this influx that people were expecting? And then we thought, well, if we're expecting an influx, this is a really great opportunity to pause and reflect on how, um, how are we meant to treat them? What's the evidence guiding the treatment of codeine dependence? Um, we then wanted to complete a retrospective chart review looking at the way that we're currently treating patients who are codeine dependent, um, because one of the first steps of service optimization is assessing baseline practice to then kind of decide what changes we might need to make. And then finally, as kind of a, a later decision, we decided to add on this genetic study, um, which I'll talk about a bit later. So this is the first stage, which was just looking at how did presentations change. Um, the dark blue is all opioids, um, sorry, other opioids, and the light blue is codeine. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my pointer there, but around um, the third quarter of 2017, there was the peak, remembering that it would have been quarter one of 2018 that the laws came into effect. Um, and so it indicated that people had probably been preparing and that the um, efforts that had been made by um, a large number of different groups to kind of lobby, uh, to prepare patients for this, to prepare GPs, to offer GPs um, non-OTP approaches to withdrawing patients from codeine, it probably all helped. Um, so whilst we had a small peak, and it happened early, we certainly weren't overloaded. And by January 2018, you can see that the codeine presentations were actually dropping back to kind of baseline um, levels. So that's interesting. It wasn't all as horrific as what, the, um, uh, what people had expected. The next thing was looking at the literature um, around how do we treat these patients. Um, and we were quite fortunate that Dr. Nielsen had recently done a systematic review looking at all the literature on codeine dependence and the identification of people with codeine dependence and how to treat them. Um, she also looked at um, the complications of CACC use. Um, and so what her literature review really summarised was that there is very limited um, codeine specific information out there. Um, and that most of the evidence that guides the way that we treat all patients with opioid dependence is based off heroin users, which uh, was, of course, very reasonable because it used to be the primary group that we were treating. Um, so 
we decided that, okay, there wasn't that much literature available back until 2016. And so I repeated a literature review looking at the last two years um, to see whether or not there might have been some new information that had come out or, or bigger studies, especially within Australia, given that this had been a relatively hot topic for the last two years. Um, and we found that 14 new studies had been uh, done. There was a lot of qualitative literature um, and there had been no new direct um, literature on how we best treat code independence with OTP. And so really our the, the most informative study we have is by Dr. Nielsen herself, which was a um, case series of 27 patients who were treated with buprenorphine. So with that in mind, we thought, well, look, this is an area that could benefit from extra information. And so that led us into the sort of the um, second part of our study. Um, so just summarising what um, Dr Nielsen and the literature review that I did as well, what, what do we really know? Well, codeine, people who are dependent on codeine do differ from heroin users uh, and, and sort of illicit substance users in that they tend to have higher rates of employment. Um, they often have more, um, I'm going to sneeze, I think. No, I'm oh, okay. Um, they often have um, better social supports. They certainly have much higher rates of chronic pain, and I will talk about that more in a minute. Um, psychiatric comorbidity is particularly high, and we know that psychiatric comorbidity is high for um, most people with a substance dependence, um, but it was even higher than what um, research indicates you would see with illicit substance users. And there was a real prevalence of mood disorders and anxiety disorders. And the other um, difference between in most of the studies on illicit opioid users and codeine dependence patients is that there was much higher rates of women who are using codeine heavily. Um, and so while most of the studies on heroin use would indicate that about a third of the um, population are female. Um, in studies on codeine, it, it's very close to half. Um, the other things that seem to come up in the literature is that there are lower rates of recent criminal activity, that substance diversion tends to be a lower risk. Um, there is more social stability, so less frequently um, having to manage patients who are homeless um, and significantly lower rates of IV drug use. So around the 20% mark um, compared to, we know, um, the classic heroin using population, it's much, much higher, 70, 80%. So there's quite a bit of qualitative literature on what leads people to become dependent on codeine. Um, and they tend to fall into two main groups. So the first group are the group that initially and or ongoing, uh, have ongoing use of codeine for pain. And there's this real um, feeling that they have a legitimate medical issue that requires treatment, that the chronic pain is the issue, not the addiction. Um, and, and there's certainly a strong sense um, from that group that they're very different to other substance users. The second group um, is perhaps a little bit more aware that their use is not classically for pain. And so there's um, a sort of nice, a number of nice studies that highlight that this group tend to think of codeine as their secret solace, that it elevates their mood, that it provides social confidence, stress relief, but it's also associated with a sense of shame. Um, and certainly the codeine dependence at the levels um, that we have seen in this study uh, requires that the patient was going around to vast numbers of pharmacies um, or doctors in order to access the quantities that they required to um, feel normal and to prevent opioid withdrawal. And I think that having, um, you had a group that perhaps feel quite uncomfortable with the fact that they are then having to lie to pharmacists um, or doctors about the reasons for their use. And it's important to also recognise that many of them would have started in that first group with pain and that then things have shifted into that second group. Um, both, in fact, it was really common that, all, that almost all participants in the qualitative study said that the, the escalation in their codeine use was very insidious. Um, 
And before they knew it, things had really escalated out of control. And there was also a strong theme that they were very hesitant to access ADS treatment. Um, and the reasons that they felt so uncomfortable about accessing our services was that they felt that there was significant stigma associated with um, ADS, that addiction um, uh, clinicians lacked knowledge about pain, that they wouldn't understand that they weren't um, like our other patients, that they needed different kinds of care. They also felt that OTP was very restrictive and demeaning. Um, and they were sort of clued in enough to know that one of the main things that addiction services would offer them would be um, OTP, and they didn't often want that. Um, and some of the studies showed that um, around 70 to 75 percent had never sought help and if they had sought help it tended to be online and it was often in um, you know chat rooms and very informal um, which meant that they were then not accessing kind of um, I guess evidence-based or, or, or more um, higher level uh, support. So when we reflect then on the fact that there's very very limited literature guiding how we treat codeine dependence, basically it means that the guidance that all of us have when we see a codeine dependent patient is completely based off our Queensland guidelines, in, well here in Queensland at least, um, and that's based off studies on heroin dependent patients. And so I thought it was good to just take a moment to reflect on how appropriate that is. We know that the guidelines recommend a stepped care approach based on risk um, and certainly less restrictive treatment like psychological therapy, um, medication tapering is recommended if you're of the lower um, dependence risk. And the positives of a buprenorphine mediated withdrawal is that it's quick, it's inexpensive, it tends to be less stigmatising because it only takes a few weeks and then you can go back to your GP. Um, However, as we most of us are aware, we know that certainly um, in heroin dependence, maintenance treatment has significantly improved outcomes, not just with opioid relapse to opioid use, but also in terms of socioeconomic participation, um, treatment engagement, and mental and physical health. And it's for that reason that Queensland actually has a 40% retention goal at 12 months, so that we are encouraged to try to keep people on OTP for at least a year if possible, because the evidence says that's gonna be the best interest for the patient. And so then what about buprenorphine versus methadone? So I was actually quite interested to see that 61% of OTP prescriptions for the country um, are for methadone. And I don't know if that surprises anyone else, but here in Queensland, we are a bit unique in that we're, we buck the trend and we're 60% buprenorphine. Um, the only other state that is like us is the Northern Territory. Um, and I wonder if that could be a geographic um, uh, factor in that um, methadone is certainly more um, complicated to dispense and to access, whereas buprenorphine is an easier medication. Um, the other benefits of buprenorphine are that you can rapidly titrate people. Um, there's the option of second, third daily treatment. Um, we are often a lot more comfortable giving higher numbers of takeaway medications um, because buprenorphine has that ceiling effect on, on respiratory depression. And so perhaps for states that are more geographically um, spread out, that could be quite beneficial. Um, or maybe Queensland's just uh, ahead of the game and is realising that methadone is uh, a medication with some challenges in terms of um, combinations with other medications, QTC prolongation, sedation, overdose risk. Um, and I guess when we reflect on what does that mean for codeine dependent patients, well, um, we know that they're a bit more complex, that they've got lots of psychiatric comorbidity, um, and we know that they have chronic pain and they might be on other sedative medications for their chronic pain. Um, and so that's a bit of a warning in terms of considering methadone. The other thing is we know that this group are more likely to be employed. And so there are some challenges with three months of daily dosing um, I guess that applies to both buprenorphine and methadone. However, we're perhaps more able to um, relax the usual guidelines in a codeine-dependent patient if we needed to for their work, if we're using buprenorphine. <laughs> 
So then what about doses? So the guidelines would suggest that 12 to 24 milligrams of buprenorphine um, is optimal. And we know that receptor occupancy occurs, um, that the receptors are saturated for, at about 16 milligrams. Um, and so um, we wondered, well, how applicable is that dose range for a codeine dependent patient given that we do expect that people using codeine would be having lower, um, morphine equivalent um, intake than say someone on heroin. And so then briefly looking at our study, we hope to um, do a convenient sample of um, close to two years or 18 months um, of all the patients presenting to Melaleuca and Biella um, who had had a primary codeine dependence. We decided that we would only look at buprenorphine um, as we were sort of aiming to emulate some of the um, findings that Dr. Nielsen had done in her case review, which had purely looked at buprenorphine. Um, and so we excluded methadone patients. Um, we hoped to find out, was there an association between the amount of codeine that people were taking and the amount of buprenorphine that they required? And the benefits for this would be, if you were a clinician assessing someone and they were on a lower dose of codeine, you might be able to better um, tailor both their expectations and your predictions of how things would go. If you could say, oh, well, they're on a lower dose, so they're just gonna need a low dose of bup, or they're on a very high dose, so we're expecting they're gonna get up to 24. So that was our goal. We thought that probably there would be an association between the two, um, and we thought that probably the amount of buprenorphine that they would be treated with would be lower than the classic doses that people would use for heroin dependence. Um, so, so this was just the flow chart of patients that were included. So there was 112 patients initiated on OTP who were applicable for our study in that 18 month period. Um, most of them, wait, 11. I don't know what, sorry, I don't know what that bit means there on the slide. Um, we know that three of them were initiated on methadone out of the 112. And so then just pausing for a second to reflect on the fact that 61% of the nation is, who's on OTP are prescribed methadone and we're below 3% methadone. And so that's a really interesting thing that we found out just via our exclusions that already addiction staff were essentially not using methadone for, co for codeine dependent patients. And I think that's an interesting thing for us to look into with pharmaceutical opioids more generally. Um, is this a trend that we're seeing across all pharmaceutical opioids or is it codeine specific? Um, in the end, we had 100 patients who met our inclusion criteria. The majority were initiated on maintenance OTP, um, but 29 did do a buprenorphine supported withdrawal. So, looking at the two groups, um, we did uh, see if there was any particular difference between the withdrawal and the maintenance group. But overall, we were mostly just interested in what does a code independent cohort look like. Um, so the mean age of this group um, was about 37.5 years, 44% of our cohort were female, nearly half were employed or studying, 28 were on a DSP, or old age pension, 25% were unemployed, and just over a quarter reported that they had pain as the reason for codeine being initiated. So a few interesting things there, 50% um, employed or studying is significantly higher than the statistics that are seen for heroin dependent clients, uh, certainly that are published. Um, and another interesting thing there was that really only a quarter mentioned that pain was the primary reason they started um, using codeine. And potentially people had used it as a one-off pain relief and then had that euphoria or that calming effect. And then the next time that they kind of used it for, um, was for non-pain reasons. Um, but that's quite interesting um, because this is a group that considers themselves very, very different to the majority of patients accessing addiction services and yet only 25% initiated for chronic pain, sorry for pain. Um, the significance in the yellow there was just that the withdrawal group were more likely to say that they didn't have pain um, and, and I suppose that makes sense that perhaps if you're going to have ongoing 
pain that you would do better off being on maintenance treatment. The next one was looking at comorbid psychiatric conditions. So essentially, they were very, very common. So 86% said that they had a current comorbid psychiatric condition. Um, and depression was 68%, um, anxiety was 50%. So again, that's quite interesting. This is a complex group and, and you do wonder if that feeds into the reasons as to why they've continued to overuse codeine. 35% had a history of psychological trauma, and I would imagine that that kind of number is quite common uh, amongst all substance. Uh, well, certainly there would be high rates of um, psychological trauma in any substance use in patient. Um, Non-opioid substance use was quite high, um, particularly 60% were current smokers. 49% were currently using a benzodiazepine. Now, we didn't differentiate if that was a prescribed five milligrams Valium a day, or if that was an illicitly accessed, um, you know, alprazolam in enormous quantity. So, so we were just sort of wondering, uh, what is the benzodiazepine use more generally? Um, and that feeds into the safety risk, even if it is low dose, it's important. Um, 22% reported current problematic alcohol intake um, and half had had previous or current problematic alcohol intake, um, which is interesting as well, I think. 25% had injected drugs at least once in their life and 41% had used methamphetamines in their lifetime. And again, this is interesting statistics. So these are not people who have only ever used codeine and never had any kind of problem with any other substance, um, which again, probably doesn't surprise us, but um, is, is an interesting thing to understand um, given, given the perceptions that the codeine users tend to have about themselves. So how much codeine were they using? Um, the average use length was about five years. The mean intake was between 545 and 667, depending on the withdrawal and the maintenance group. Um, and that wasn't a significantly significant difference between the amount of codeine between the group. So what I'm saying there is that codeine intake didn't help to decide whether someone had a withdrawal or a maintenance um, decision. And when you think, well, what does that mean in terms of real figures? 667 milligrams of codeine equates to about 53 Nurofen plus tablets per day. Um, so these were people that were very heavily dependent um, and really had to spend a lot of their time trying to access treatment. So then, what about how much buprenorphine they were using? Um, the withdrawal group we've separated and the mean length of withdrawal was about eight days, um, which is similar, I suppose, to a normal, normal to another patient. Um, if, and they tended to receive a peak buprenorphine dose of eight milligrams. When we looked at the maintenance group, um, the stabilization dose, and I'm referring to the dose at which you'd send a patient out to pharmacy, was 15 milligrams, the mean dose, um, and the maximum dose was 19 milligrams. Um, so these are, these are good range, mid-range um, doses of OTP as the mean. Um, and so, of course, some patients were lower, some were higher. We had about, you can see on the graph there, 13% um, had 32 milligrams or above. We actually had one patient that was um, finally reached 40 milligrams of buprenorphine for their codeine dependence. Um, and so that really just reminds us that you can't assume when you see a codeine dependent patient that they're gonna end up on a low dose of buprenorphine. 52% of the patients across our two Metro North sites uh, had been in OTP treatment for 12 months. So um, our services were achieving the METOD guidelines goal of meeting that 40% retention. So this is a linear regression analysis that we did on both the withdrawal and the maintenance groups, which essentially showed us that there was a statistically significant association between how much codeine you were having and how much buprenorphine you required, but that clinically, it was not enough of, a, of an association to be of any real benefit. So 
What I would take from that is that you can't predictably decide if the amount of codeine they're using will help you to estimate how much buprenorphine they'll need. And so we really just need to take a very individualized approach, um, daily assessment, just, just like we would with any client really, and have an open mind as to how little or how a large uh, they, a dose they may need. Um, so there were a number of limitations. Look, this was a, um, we had 100 patients, so it was um, a bigger study than had been done, but still a small one. And, and it would be good to have a prospective um, uh, study of this kind. Of course, there's all of the limitations around recall bias, um, that diagnosis required the patient to kind of let clinicians know, um, and that there's likely to be some under-reporting of both um, comorbid psychiatric conditions because of stigma, but also with this group being so uh, keen to try to distinguish themselves from other uh, people who have a substance dependence, it seemed likely that they would potentially minimise other substance use. And so that's something I think that we need to keep in mind as well um, when we're doing those initial assessments on codeine dependent patients or any kind of pharmaceutical opioid dependent patient because there's likely to be stigma and concern and shame about the fact that they might be using other substances. So the conclusions, look, I think I've been through most of those. Um, I'll just move on. So then the second study, and this is a much uh, briefer overview because we have no results yet. Um, this was a study that we initiated, um, I think mid last year. And we were hoping, I'll just move this. We were hoping to look um, at how CYP2, DD, 2D6 um, variations might affect the likelihood of someone developing codeine dependence and whether or not their CYP2, um, 2D6, um, I guess, the number of um, copies that they have could influence the requirement uh, for OTP. Um, and whether that might explain some of our difficulty um, predicting the amount of buprenorphine that people need. And we were able to access a large recent study that um, uh, looked at the genetics of uh, about 5,000 Australians um, and classified their CYP2D6 status into low, normal, ultra rapid, etc. cetera. Um, and so we're going to be using that as our base to compare. Um, what what are our proportions of those um, ultra rapid, normal rapid and poor rapid metabolizers um, compared to that larger group? Um, and so it's a relatively new field of pharmacogenomics. It's an interesting area. Some of you may have already had patients that have come to you and said, I've done that expensive um, genetic study looking at um, all of my enzymes and I found out that you know I'm a, a inducer for a certain substrate which means that I need higher doses of venlafaxine or something like that. We're starting to see that. Um, cost is a limitation um, but I think this is an interesting area um, for us to explore. And so we had um, two hypotheses. We thought that there would be a higher prevalence of efficient metabolizers normal or ultra rapid um, in patients with codeine use disorders uh, when you compared it to the general population. And we did think that those who had ultra rapid metabolizer status would be more likely to require a higher dose of buprenorphine proportionate to their stated um, codeine intake. Um, and so what's the significance of this study? Well, um, if this is confirmed, I think that it could add to a range of precautions which could be taken before a doctor prescribes codeine um, because you might then be able to be uh, identify those people who would be at greater risk of both toxicity and unintentional overdose, but also at a greater risk of developing a codeine, uh, sorry, an opioid use disorder. Um, so the methods, which is um, currently, you know, as I said, this is in process at the moment. Um, we are doing a buccal swab um, on consenting patients, uh, which only takes, you know, 30 seconds inside their cheek. We then send that down to Melbourne um, to the same lab that did uh, the large study, the large Melbourne-based study um, with the 5,000 just general population members. Um, we've really encourage clinicians to continue to look out for patients who've 
um, presented with a primary codeine dependence. Now they may have then gone on, codeine may have been a gateway drug, um, but if their primary um, issue was codeine for you know, a decent period, then we can recruit them even if they later went on to say oxycodone. Um, they get a $30 Coles voucher um, and they are able to find out their results. And people are finding that quite interesting. And there's been actually a lot of interest from the patients themselves to work out, well, could this help me to understand why codeine became so problematic for me when some people don't have that issue? So, um, some thoughts for the future and before I go there I'll just let you know we have got 42 people recruited to our study at the moment um, we're hoping to um, you know we've actually reached the minimum requirement that we had um, but we are hoping to double that double that so to Metro North um, addiction service clinicians please keep helping us out with that um, I think then just some final points there may be the opportunity that we could use genetic screening um, to help us decide which which drugs, both psychiatric and um, analgesic, are best for our clients? We need to be aware of the fact that people don't respond to codeine the same in in the same way, and that there is a high risk of overdose um, with all opioids, including codeine. And so, contemplating whether people should have naloxone given to them, um, and then finally, just remembering that. What I said about coding, and I think we can um, extrapolate this to all pharmaceutical opioid users, that they see themselves as being a bit different to the classic um, person accessing addiction treatment, that they feel that they have a chronic pain problem frequently. Um, and I didn't mention, but 50% of our current people on OTP for codeine dependence said they had current pain. Um, that we need to be thinking about a chronic disease model, trying to improve our um, links with chronic pain teams, with allied health, um, linking psychiatrists with pain specialists, with addiction specialists, um, and also the critical role of general practitioners in pharmaceutical opioid users. And that's it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for a really interesting presentation on coding and you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm one of those clinicians that probably minimised a little bit the severity of people that were using coding. So it was really interesting to see uh, some of the risks early on in your presentation regarding, you know, death rates and things like that for unintentional overdoses were quite significant. Um, and so I kind of feel a little bit bad about some of the stuff I might have done in the past as a result. So thank you for highlighting my applause there, Sarah. But yeah, no, an excellent presentation and one that was answering many questions that were coming up as, as you were going along. So I was busy writing down and then scribbling out. But I have got some questions if you've got some time to go, go through them with us. Um, so you mentioned uh, that it's possible to have this profiling done. How would somebody, if they were interested in that regarding the CYP enzymes, what's, how, how do you go and get that done? Is that something you access through a GP or what's the process for doing that? Yeah. Um, it is. GPs can organise it. When I worked at Damascus, I know that some of the private psychiatrists there were using it. Um, cost is often prohibitive. So it, I, I believe, and I haven't looked this up recently, but I believe it's around $200 for a test. Um, it's I've, One of the companies I've heard of is the MyDNA. Um, and when you do it through a company like that for $200 or so, they won't just do CYP. They'll do all of your main enzymes. Um, um, and you can then use that to help guide treatment for antidepressant use, antipsychotics and analgesics. Um, I think that I wouldn't jump into people doing it as a regular thing yet, unless they had treatment resistant illness, particularly psychiatric, where they were wondering if perhaps they need doses that are higher than those that are recommended in guidelines. And I think that's when some of the private psychiatrists have had success showing that, you know, this person might need um, 400 milligrams of venlafaxine or whatever, because the enzymes show that they metabolize it really quickly. And I know that it's been used in that way, but if you were just someone who'd had one antidepressant, I wouldn't spend the money yet. I'd just try another one, I think. Yeah. I think that's good advice. Um, and I'm, I, I apologize if I'm asking you things that you don't know, Sarah. Um, <laughs> the the uh, variances in the CYP2D6 are quite uh, vast. You know, as you say, there's about four categories of different uh, producers of these 
producers of the enzyme. Is that just for that enzyme or does that also carry across into other cytochrome enzymes? Yeah, it carries across into the others. So I, I'm, I'm only looked at the 2D6 in terms of the sure. specific categories, but I've seen some people's my DNA reports and it gives them a, um, oh, you know, like a zero to 10 kind of, you know, an extreme inducer or a mild inducer. Yeah, and yeah. it's very detailed in your analysis to the point that it can be quite tricky for the untrained um, person to work out how to interpret that. Um, and so um, it's not something that I think that psychiatrists or GPs are really confident with. It's perhaps most important though, if you were on the extreme end, so either a really poor metabolizer or an ultra rapid metabolizer of any of those enzymes, then it's clear. I think it gets a lot more murky when you're in the mid range as to how to interpret that. But no, all, all of them have varying levels and Thank the you. test will tell you cool. where you Thank sit. You. Yeah. You um, obviously we started, or not started, but in the early part of the presentation, there was a talk of the unintentional deaths. Um, is there, when a death occurs, particularly you mentioned, for example, uh, you know, the situation where a mother was breastfeeding the baby. If deaths occur, and particularly in children, somebody's asked, do they actually carry out a profile post-mortem to find out if that was one of the issues that led to that death? I believe they do because I'm, I know that in, the, in one of the case studies where the infant who was breastfed died, they did the, um, they did the CYP2T, 2D T, uh, 6 testing on the mother <laughs> and the mother ended up having three copies of the gene. So she was, um, even two would count as an ultra rapid metabolizer and she had three. So she was um, an extremely efficient metabolizer, therefore had far more morphine produced than ever could have been expected. Yeah. I know that they have now um, banned pain stop, which is the one they used to give to children, um, post tonsillectomy and other um, conditions where there's airway swelling in children or when they're not going to be supervised in hospital post-operatively um, because the risks are just too high. And so I've, I'm no expert in peds, but I think they're moving more to oxycodone and paracetamol and neurofen because those are more predictable. Um, and I think that's very sensible. And it was only, I was a JHO maybe eight years ago and we were using pain stop all the time. And, and I, I expect that things must have changed recently, um, I, I presume, because yeah. it just seems too risky otherwise. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, talking about the different profiles of people, now we know that certain drugs can be inducers of enzymes, for example. Um, yeah. Is there actually a way that you know of that a person, so if they are a poor metabolizer, can they do something to change that or is that something they're then stuck with for their life essentially? Oh, you'd have to be very clever. I reckon <laughs> Mark could work something out for them. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so with, you know, with clozapine and smoking and um, a coffee, so coffee, smoking, grapefruit juice, um, all affects CYP ooh, three, ooh. three, A, four. 3A4, that's it. Yeah. No. Um, and so we know that we can tell patients if they cut down on their smoking, that they that we can use much lower doses of codeine. Um, and when they're admitted to hospital and we somewhat cruelly give them um, non-caffeinated coffee most of the time until the tea lady comes twice a day. So for some people, that's a huge reduction in coffee um, that we need to be aware that that can also cause significant shifts in their clozapine level. And so, yeah, um, smoking, depending on the enzyme, I don't believe that smoking, sorry, smoking does affect 2D6 as well. So no, yeah, there are some, in our study, we're asking the smoking status of people to decide if that affects it. The other thing is um, other medications that, are, that they're on will have an input. And so I think that one you can see there, um, if they're on SSRIs, if they're on um, methadone, um, all of those other types of medications, rifampicin, so antibiotics can affect it. Um, absolutely, that can change it. Um, and the other thing is that there's a significant cultural component. So what the um, Mustafa paper showed was that there was um, 
there was a real variation depending on your cultural background. Um, that's not something we'll be exploring in the study because it was just too complex. Um, but it's something to think about as well, that there are certain um, races that tend to have much higher um, chances of either being poor or ultra rapid mm. metabolizers. And that's something you could look up easily as well. I've, I've, I've done a fair bit of research on that for various things that I've done. And uh, whilst there are, as you, exactly as you say, there are certain cultures or races, um, ethnic minorities, whatever you want to call them, that have uh, ver you know, different variances, the general consensus seems to be that there's significant variances amongst individual cultures anyway. And so it's not something that you can take as uh, given that a particular culture is likely to have a particular variant. So, you know, I would say, it's, you know, add, adding to what you say, but be cautious and treat everybody as an individual rather than making assumptions if you hear a particular thing, because it doesn't seem to be as black and white as that. No. Um, do you think, you again, early on you were showing that there's been... Uh, fairly significant increases over the past few years in you know, oxycodone and codeine use, which has also coincided with a reduction in heroin use in Australia. Do you think with uh, the scheduling and certainly real-time reporting and things coming in that are monitoring the prescribing of opioids uh, more closely, do you think that that's likely to shift back the other way? And I know that's asking you to predict the future, but do you think that restricting and scheduling is likely to see an increase in heroin coming back in Australia? I don't know. I know that people said that that might occur with codeine and it hasn't. We yeah. actually have seen that there wasn't a huge increase in oxycodone use either, which was another thing that people said was that yeah, they'll I go from milder yep. pharmaceutical opioids to stronger ones and that didn't occur what what my reading would indicate would be that this group and the pharmaceutical opioid dependent group in general see themselves as very different to your average illicit substance user now my as we mentioned in this study that's not always the case but the 25 percent iv drug use was have they at any point in their life ever injected substances now it's still a big thing because to have made the point to get the needle out is, is a big call yeah. and that's still a lot higher much much higher than the general population rates of iv drug use but um in terms of current yeah. iv drug use it was hu hugely lower than that yeah. um would they go to heroin look maybe i don't think that you'd get um an enormous amount that would switch over um, I think it is going to get harder. I think that this is really highlighting and you could do a whole nother speak, uh, talk on it, the complexities of managing this group that have chronic pain and the fact that we have a limited access to multidisciplinary chronic pain teams. And I know that um, Mela Luca, I just did six months there, we're seeing enormous amounts of complex patients with chronic pain, psychiatric comorbidity, limited capacity for emotional regulation and pain distress tolerance mm -hmm. um, and there are limitations to what chronic pain teams can offer. The wait list is very long to get into a chronic pain clinic and then there is frequently the pushback from chronic pain teams that if there's a significant um, evidence of opioid dependence or other substance use that they tend to then say deal with the dependence first and then we'll see them and that's really tricky because uh, you really need to be treating both of them at the same time. Very much so. Um, so I know that as part of our psychiatry training, we do six months in a pain clinic. It gives us a little bit of knowledge, but not enough. We've got some people that are doing the dual certificate of chronic pain, even, well, Belinda did three, didn't she? Addiction, pain yeah. and um, psychiatry. So I think that's the way of the future as well to try to, how can we support this group using OTP um, potentially, um, so that we're helping them to manage so they don't feel they have to go to heroin or other illicit substance use. And, and just on that note as well, we are getting, there is some good evidence coming out that buprenorphine particularly is very good for chronic pain. Um, and so remembering that a pain specialist can only prescribe up to like two or three um, milligrams of buprenorphine and we can prescribe enormously than higher yeah. than that. We've yeah. certainly got the potential to provide some relief there. Um, but I think, yeah, I think there are going to be service shifts that will need to occur given that the demographics are changing significantly. Yeah, agreed.
Um, on one of the, uh, when you were looking at whether the amount of codeine used would reflect into the dose of buprenorphine that they were, that's the chart, yep. yep. Um, now there wasn't a clear uh, pattern emerging that, you know, high levels of codeine led to high levels of buprenorphine. So if it wasn't what they were using that determined the dose that they ended up on, was there any other correlations that came out, whether it was the persisting pain, whether it was having complex other comorbidities such as, you know, psychiatric presentation? Was there anything else that was showing which people may be on the NIT requiring a higher dose than perhaps the others if it wasn't codeine related? Um, we didn't do the stats to see whether or not other factors predicted buprenorphine requirement. It's an interesting point and something that we should um, look into. Um, it, it, we, I mean, in terms of maintenance, just going back there, um, there wasn't significant differences, say, between the maintenance and the withdrawal group. And you can assume that the withdrawal group was kind of the lower... Um, you know, I don't know, a slightly lower end. Um, yeah. So nothing jumped out really. The only big difference between those groups was that those who underwent a withdrawal had much, much higher rates of cannabis use. So I don't know, I know Jeremy has talked about the fact that cannabis is something that is being used more and more, both medicinal and other, um, yeah. as something that people are using for chronic pain. So is that, I don't know, is that, is that yeah. related? It raises more questions for future studies really. What's that? It raises more questions for future studies. Yes, exactly. It really does. And I think that's a good point. Um, you would imagine that chronic pain would affect the dose. Certainly yeah. in practice, anecdotally, we see that. But then Jim's, Jim, Jim has also given some good advice around the fact that you need to be wary of what you're treating and that there is always the risk that patients with chronic pain who came to us on relatively low opioid equivalents um, on some kind of, you know, tramadol or whatever, that we've now gone 10 times the equivalent of opioid that they were on and they're still pushing for more. And so something Jim sort of highlighted to me was you need to be aware of what you're treating and are you just pushing it up because they're liking some of the other elements of the OTP and, you know, harm versus benefit and and that's something to be aware of a little bit as well sure and i should point out that when sarah says jim i'm not going to claim credit for that she's referring to dr jim Pena, i assume sorry um, yes I am. rather than to myself um, yep. although it sounds very flattering so i'm quite happy to listen to that <laughs> um another question is as you very rightly said these people see themselves very, very differently to our regular QOTP clients. Yeah. And there is that resistance to coming to accessing our services because they're gonna likely, in their, in their mind at least, be viewed the same as everybody else. Is there any thoughts that you might have on how we might be able to make our services more appealing to those people coming through the door and less intimidating? And I know that that's, again, a $6 million question. Yeah, no, but that's a great question because part of the study was also what changes might we need to make. There was an, an audit comp component, a quality improvement component, um, which is something we haven't done that. I should have added that to this next stage. Um, look, the Scott project is great in that regard. Some of these clients are perfect for early transition back to general practitioners. Um, they're often more stable. They're not likely to, to divert. Um, I think that having that as something you could mention really early on, that they might not need to see us consistently at our clinics, that they could just do the initiation and then go to their regular GP. I think that would be really reassuring. Um, I think that um, if you can make steps to make the waiting room a bit nicer, maybe have some information in the waiting room about chronic pain, about the varying sure. types of people who are dependent on substances now and trying to have some facts up there about the fact that they're not the only, it's not them with their codeine dependence and 90% who are heroin dependent. You know, putting some of that up could be really useful. Yeah, I know no Melaluke problem. has been trying to make their um, waiting room a bit nicer, which is a really good thing as well. Um, 
I think giving education to GPs and pain specialists also. Um, I think that even pain specialists, well, in my experience, pain specialists have got the stigma about us as well in a way, and they're really hesitant to talk to their patients about going to addiction services because they, they see it as something bad that they've given up on their patient or their you know, the patient's going to explode when they hear that. And I think that it's a bit like when we talk to a patient about the fact that they have borderline personality disorder. There are ways that you can break challenging news so that it doesn't come across as a bad thing, yeah, um, sure. that it highlights the potential positives of recognising a complex condition because that means we can treat it. And yeah, I think yeah. maybe um, the, the comorbidity of chronic pain and substance dependence is something that we need to work out how to sort of sell to patients in a way so that it doesn't come across stigmatizing when they first hear about it. I think that's a very valid point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, somebody's also mentioned in the chat box, and I'm aware of this, and you know, it's not something I shout about to my clients, but we've got clinicians watching today, so it is worth mentioning, I guess, that when uh, the TGA rescheduled uh, coding, they only rescheduled codeine and they didn't reschedule all products that have codeine like products in them. So we know uh, Ricodine, the cough syrup, dihydrocodeine managed to escape that scheduling. So somebody's put that people are still uh, non medicinally using those in large quantities. And I think it is something that we do as clinicians need to be aware of that it is just codeine that was rescheduled. I agree. And also there's perhaps a perception that ricodine, because it's still there, is not strong uh, yeah. or it's not really codeine. I've heard a lot from the psychiatric nurses. Um, and when they say it's not really codeine, they're implying it's not a concern. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is an issue um, that it's yeah. slipped under the radar and there's an assumption that because it wasn't rescheduled, it's really not a risk, um, yeah. which is not true. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, because I know and everybody watching and listening uh, needs to thank Sarah because Sarah's actually giving up her part of her time on holiday with her family to be here and do this with us. So I won't hold you up any longer, Sarah. But one final question, which I think is going to be useful for you and for clinicians watching, is for your study, you said that you had the minimum number already. Um, but obviously you always want more numbers. How does somebody go about getting someone into your study? Yes. Um, so there are a number of different people that have been approved to um, actually take the swab. And so that's Jeremy, Mark, myself, Louise. Um, there must be a couple more at Biella, Jim. Um, but I think there are a few more at Biella that I'm forgetting. Apologies. Um, and so the folders are there at Melaleuca and Biella. Um, flag it with um, any of us, send us an email. Um, I think that we're still working on the system. At Melaleuca, we had a big sheet you could put a sticker up so we'd be aware of it. Um, and tell the patients because they get really, they're really keen. Anyone yep. that I've consented has just been so interested in it. So it's not something that um, is gonna be challenging to talk to them about. Um, it really only takes five minutes. Um, yeah, I, Jason, did it, I did it last Friday with someone who was a really, sorry, talking over you then. That was no, really you're right. um, but yeah, I was at Malaluka working on Friday and we had somebody that we signed up to your program. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a very simple process. He was highly excited to be uh, thinking that he might be able to change the future for other people that are in a similar sort of situation to them. So he was very passionate to get involved with that, which is, as you say, seems to be the general consensus. So yeah, definitely get in touch with Melaleuca or Biala or just email myself and I'll forward it to Sarah or Jeremy, but we'll get you in touch, definitely. Listen, yeah, I'm gonna I think let there you are know. posters around with our details on it as well. 